Welcome to the Speak Like a Leader podcast with John Bates. Welcome to the show. With me today, I have someone that I have known for, gosh, a really long time. Uh, I think it's almost embarrassing to think about how long ago that was. But Robert Hauser is a visual storyteller whom I met back in the dot-com days. And he took fabulous photographs of the Big Words dot com team and we've kept in touch over the years he's an award-winning storyteller he has photographed on location for advertising pharma and corporate clients for over 30 years and he's also a brilliant sculptor and you can find him at roberthauser.com r-o-b-e-r-t h-o-u-s-e-r.com and he's also on instagram at Robert Hauser. He's on Facebook at robert.hauser.photography. And you can see his sculpture on Instagram at, at Robert Hauser Studio. So Robert, thank you very much for joining me. Um, we got, I like responded to an email from like, <laughs> I think a couple of years ago and we got back in touch and we had such an interesting conversation that I wanted to get you on speak like a leader dot show to, to talk about visual communication. Cause you're a visual storyteller and you're an extremely creative guy and you've got some really interesting ideas about creativity and visual storytelling. And you've been at this for a while. So, you know, I, I've got a lot of listeners who are at organizations, big, big corporate clients, people at startups, people who are in the pharma industry. Um, you know, what are some of the things that, I mean, I don't quite know how to start. I know there's so much to talk about, but what's one of the things that you think about when you're doing visual storytelling? Let's start with visual storytelling because I think that you've got a real knack at that. And I think there are things that we could take into our lives, not just with the photographs that we're all taking with our iPhones, but ways that we could apply your thinking around visual storytelling to our verbal st storytelling. You know, I was recently at um, <clears throat> a retirement party for one of my college professors and um, uh, I double majored in psychology and comparative literature and uh, I'm listening to all these people talk about literature, and I realized that I was one of the non-literary people in the room. And I, I use that as to say that what I got out of comparative literature was more um, observing and noticing. And, and I think it taught me to be aware and see things in a different way. Um, and so as a result, it applied very well to my photography career that I ended up pursuing. Um, but I do think that storytelling starts with noticing and observation. Um, and I have an obscenely comfortable knack of um, just picking up on little things that are present. Um, for me as a portrait photographer, that is one of the things that I use as what I call my way in. Um, you know, my uh, ability to notice something about someone is how you create a connection with them. Um, and sometimes that connection has to happen very yeah. quickly. Um, and, you know, you don't have the, the opportunity to spend a lot of time figuring out the connection. Um, and it's amazing how, you know, I, I, I think of these things as small keys um, really kind of help kind of grease the wheels in a way. Um, and once you yeah. can get that started, um, I feel like the story then can come, unfold once the connection can happen. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I don't remember specifically what you did when you took those photographs of us back in like 1998 or whatever it was. But I do remember, you know, I remember all of us being younger and I do remember you somehow really establishing a rapport with us, like, very quickly. And those photographs that you got of us are just great photographs. And we all 
thought they were so great and they really captured the personality of, of each person. And they captured the personality of the business that we had. And they were, you know, they were just spectacular photos. And so that noticing and observing as a way in and creating that connection with your subjects, like I've experienced that with you and, and I can see the results of it. So I think that's really, really cool. I, I remember exactly one of the things that we did. We, <clears throat> we walked around your offices um, and I remember them being very hip, cool offices on South Park um, in San Francisco. And there were some jumpsuits in the corner. And I said to the PR person, I was yeah. like, what's with yeah. the orange jumpsuits? Um, and I guess they had been yeah. used in some marketing PR, uh, something or other. Um, well, you know, and I was like, okay, if I wore one of those things. I said, if we're going to get I wore one of those things everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to make these guys hang from the playground out front in the jumpsuits. Would they be up for That's it? That's right. And, and she said, yeah. probably not, but I'm going to ask them. And I was like, we're doing it. Um, so, yeah, we hung of you course. guys. Yeah, we were totally up for that. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the other things that I have always done in, in my approach to photography is I don't look at someone in the title that they are at. I look at someone as a person who's standing yeah. in front of me. And, you know, whether it's Steve Jobs or, you know, Bill Gates or a physician, I don't call physicians doctor. I just walk in and you're a person that I need to get a picture of. Um, and if I think your tie looks yeah. stupid, I'm going to tell you your tie looks stupid. You know, um, <laughs> I was photographing yeah. John Chambers, the Cisco CEO for many decades. Um, yeah. And I had photographed him a number of times and um, I, you know, his PR people wanted me to do this and this. And I was like, no, I just want to take you into a cube. And, and I brought him into this cube and it was just he and I. And, and I literally said, I was like, your, your tie looks dumb. Can I fix it? Um, and he wasn't used to people speaking to him like that. And again, it was kind of like, yeah, a yeah. Um, and you know, I'm a blunt New Englander and, and I take pride in that. Um, and I don't pull punches and I, and I just kind of am going to say what I think needs to be said. Um, Sarcasm is yeah. definitely something that I use. Um, I think sarcasm is something that you need <laughs> to be careful with. You need to be a trained professional in, in the sarcasm realm. Um, yeah, so right. I, I think it's, you know, if you're from Massachusetts, New Hampshire, or Maine, maybe Vermont, some of Connecticut, you have inbred skill in sarcasm. Um, and anywhere else, uh -huh. it's a little bit challenging. So um, I, I, I have brought that with me and... Um, and it's just one of the tools that I use. Um, you know, we talk about, uh, yeah. I, I spoke about observing. Um, and uh, as long as we're on the, the subject in New England, um, I had to photograph yeah. a, a, an attorney once. Um, and I had the impression from the PR people that he was not into the idea of being photographed. Um, and so they brought me through the offices and I kind of had some ideas of what I wanted to do. And then it was time to go and meet this person. Um, and he comes in very cold faced, incredibly stern, um, and uh, just kind of said, hi, how are you? Three words. And I might have told you this before, but I left this like unnatural pause. And I just stared at him for a second and he, I could see he was kind of wondering what was going on. And I just looked at him and I said, two miles from Revere Beach. And he thought for a minute, and he's like, what is this guy saying? And he said, two and a half, actually. And then all of a sudden he smiled and it was like he was in the palm of my hand. And so for the rest of the shoot, it was like yeah. this warm, wonderful thing. And it was because of those three words that he had said, yeah. I heard his accent and I placed yeah. his accent and I was off by a half mile from where he grew up. Um, and it's that's that kind of amazing. little <laughs> trick, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. And that's the kind of thing well, that I, I you know, use as a it goes, it goes to something that I talk about a lot in my trainings. And I think that this is great proof of that. I tell people small talk has been misnamed. 
Small talk is not small talk. We just misunderstand it because we don't understand how important it is because it seems like it doesn't matter what we talk about. And in a way, it doesn't matter what we talk about. We could talk about our kids. We could talk about where we're, we grew up. We could talk about whatever, a million things. But what matters is that we talk about something that connects us and puts us in the same tribe and has us you know, be somehow emotionally connected. And you nailed it when you were like two miles from Revere beach, right? Like he's like two and a half, actually. Like how did you, and all of a sudden whoop, yeah. you're in the same tribe. I mean, you're in the same tribe by like half a mile off. Right. And that's amazing. And, and those small things up front make all the difference in terms of how that relationship is going to go, you know? Right. Right. So it sounds like you've developed a real skill at, at just immediately doing something like that. Yeah. There's no question. I mean, I mean, when I walk into a situation, you know, PR people are like, well, where do you want to take a picture? And I'm like, well, I don't know if I walked in and knew ahead of time where I wanted to take a picture, <laughs> I would, I would have this preconceived notion and I would try to force that on this venue and it wouldn't work and I would waste so much of my time. And so it's better to just kind of walk in and just be sort of an open book, let it all kind of wash over you, see everything. And I'm not just looking for yeah. architecture or you know areas that I think have interesting lighting. I'm also looking around for those keys. You know, I, <clears throat> I tell this other story of a woman yeah. I was photographing who was the she was in her late twenties and she was an IT, um, she was the head of IT for a university. Um, and so it was unusual at the time for a woman to be in this role, especially someone in her twenties. And so she had this, this desire to be very professional looking and very stern. And she approached the shoot with her arms crossed and, um, you know, and, and I had been specifically been asked by the editor that, we needed pictures of her smiling and she walks into the room and I was like, this woman's not going to smile. And I don't blame her given like what <laughs> she's, the article was literally about hacking universities. Um, and so I said, hmm, I got to find something here. And so I took one frame and then I, I was maybe 10 feet away from her. And then I just stopped, left my camera on the tripod and I walked all the way up to her and just, made a ridiculous presence of looking at her bracelet on her hand, which I just happened to notice. And I made sure she noticed that I was noticing it. And then I stepped away and I said to her, by any chance, is the art on the floor downstairs yours? Do you own any of it? And she says, you know, she's like this. <clears throat> and she says, yeah, why do you ask? And she uncrosses her arms and I said, because your bracelet has the exact same color palette and grid form of one of the paintings on the second floor. And arms opened, face smiled, and all of a sudden we were chatting. And we were chatting about art. And it, it hadn't <sighs> noticed that painting and then hadn't noticed the bracelet. So yes, it's important to have the conversation, but I really think it's important to notice things ahead of time so that when you're having the conversation, um, you're, you're deepening it. You know, you're not just talking small talk. And throughout oh. my shoots, I'm always talking to people. And sometimes people get a little antsy. They're like, you know, can we take the effing picture already? You know, like, let's, we got to move on. And, um, yeah. and, and I've been blunt sometimes. I'm like, yeah, this is it. We're, this is, it's a therapy session in a way. We're trying to work through the crappy stuff so that I can find the good picture. Um, and yeah. some of that comes from me wow, telling you stories. That, I mean, that's that story just gave me goosebumps to my <laughs> wrists and my ankles. Like the the I think it's tremendously, tremendously generous noticing and observing that you do. You know, and I think it's uncanny that you would notice the picture, notice the bracelet and make that connection. Like I am now in a very good way, super envious of you. And I am now 
totally re-inspired to like notice and observe on a whole different level. Cause I think I do a similar thing with what people are saying. I think yes. I really have trained myself over the years to just listen super deeply and pull out nuances that people aren't even necessarily always aware of themselves. But boy, I could do that in the, in the environment that they're in as well. Like that to me is tremendously inspiring. And I am now taking on noticing and observing in a whole new way because of that story. That is just brilliant. Now I do have to say that I have the benefit of usually walking through a place ahead of time before I'm meeting someone. And also yeah. because of why I'm there, um, I have kind of an yeah. excuse to stare at stuff. And a lot of times a PR person yeah, will be just yeah. walking me through and they'll be talking and I'll just stop and look at a wall and they'll be like, why the F is this guy looking at this wall? You know, what? like, can we move on? <laughs> and, yeah. and I'm just like oh. collecting data, you know, so that, um, yeah. so that I can yeah. know ahead of time, you know, I'll look at somebody where they graduated from college, you know, what kind of picture is there laying on the wall? Um, you know, what yeah. type of architecture is in the room, you know, what their, the way that their, um, that reception is referred to them, you know, and then I'll bluntly ask yeah. my obvious questions too. Like, does this person have glasses, yeah. you know, how tall are they? That kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that, that gives me a little bit of a, a, a a license to be weird when I'm walking around. So that's, you know, that's a benefit I yeah. take advantage of. Well, you know, I mean, and I think it's something for everybody who's listening to think about again on a new level, right? Because I tell people, listen, you know, I guess I work with a lot of startups, let's say, and when they go out and meet with these VC firms, they know who's in the VC firm. And I tell them, you know, checking out their LinkedIn profile is not stalking, <laughs> you know, Absolutely. that's what it's there for. Go see if you have something in common with them, go read a little bit of what they're putting up there. Cause they purposefully put that up there, you know? And so go check it out and see what's there. And you know, like the stuff I have on my wall behind me, like that's all stuff that means a lot to me. And I thought about what I put up there and I put some of the most important stuff up there. And when you walk into someone's office, you can make that assumption, <laughs> you know, right. it's in their office. It matters to them. And what can that tell you about them? And how can that give you an in f with them? You know? Yeah. It, it's amazing. When you walk in, I look at, I look at people's LinkedIn all the time. Sorry, and you know, I'll I'll try to see if I know something about where they went to school or where they used to live or where they worked, you know. And if you can just walk in and and yeah. say, you know, do you like or did you like the cheeseburgers at this place? And you just randomly just kind of say that yeah. off the mark. Um, people are like, Yeah, wait, oh, well, yeah. So you know about that? Like, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I noticed it right over there, you know, but yeah, it's funny. You know, it's funny because people do that with t-shirts all the time. You know, like I always, I'll say something to someone related to the t-shirt that they're actually wearing at the moment. And it'll take people a few minutes to realize how I knew that or where that came from or what right. that was. And then they laugh, you know? Right. Yeah. But I mean, the, 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 the LinkedIn thing, you know, if you see where someone worked before and you can know someone who used to work there, do you know so-and-so? Because in 1998, yeah. you were working yeah. there or you went to such and such a college um, in, in this year, you know, I, I really knew, you know, when, yes. when the Grateful Dead played there, you know, I was at that show or something, just random weird yes. stuff. And then um, you just kind of blurt it out. And those kinds of things are really, really important. I always say, uh, you know, that's how you get the fourth and most important. Yes, because people, you know, people go in all the time with a good business plan to get to see if somebody wants to invest. And 
they'll say, yes, you know, do you like, yeah, we like it. Yeah. Do you think it's priced right? Oh yeah. I think it's priced right. Do you think it would make a difference for you to have it? Yeah, certainly. Yes. Well, do you want to sign the check and we'll get started? Oh no. We want to think about it for a minute. And what that, what just happened is logic, 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 emotion. We didn't make an emotional connection. And with you and your photography, you have to make that emotional connection. So you've gotten exceedingly good at making that emotional connection right up front, right off the bat, because, you know, I remember our, our session, we didn't have all day, you know, like we we were busy, you were busy. We had to get right to it. And we had to capture something that was going to show in that photograph. And people will look at those and they'll go, I don't, you know, I don't know why they're so good, but they're just, they're just really good. And it's because you took the time to make that emotional connection and to creatively incorporate what you knew about us into what we ended up doing, you know? I, I think and you, one of the when things you, I, I love Gar- about, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, in the beginning when you um, were referring to the, the visual storytelling and, and um, that side of it. And so, so far we've discussed entering and um, how to get it, you know, and how to make the connection. The other side of it, of course, is getting this winnow down to one specific image. And I think that's one of the challenges of still photography versus video, of course, is that I got to make it work in one frame. You know, it has to happen in 125th yeah. of a second. And that's it. That's what we got to get <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And there's so many little nuances in there. And of course, you know, there's the technical challenges. There's the lenses that you're going to use and the lighting and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. um, all the other visual cues, yeah. which are, I think, more applicable to the people who might be listening to this, are are significant. Um, and, and like you say, first impressions, you know, I, I, I tell a story of... Um, talking to my assistant when we were doing two jobs back to back. And the first job we were going to go and photograph at I don't know, some, some tech company in Silicon Valley. And um, after that, we had uh-huh. to go and shoot at a construction company, at a, at a, literally a construction site. Um, and we were supposed to photograph the guys who were working, doing the framing. Um, and so um, we stop, we go to the first shoot and we're in the parking lot of the second shoot. And, they said to me, like, why are you changing your shoes? And I was like, because we're about to walk into a construction site. He's like, well, you're not going to get muddy. And I was like, that's not the point. It's like, I can't walk into a construction site wearing dress shoes or something. I said, you just watch. I, and I put work boots on. And I said, I'm going to walk in with work boots. And I'm going to ask some random dude who's framing such and such a building if I can climb up onto his framing. If I walked in and I did that with dress shoes, he'd be like, who is this idiot? I'm like, no, get the F out. Like, you're not yeah. going to do this. Um, yeah. But if I walk in, with, yeah. and sure enough, later, my assistant was like, oh my gosh, I couldn't believe what they let you do and where they let you go. And I was like, because it's little tiny oh, yeah. messages that are important. And it's, yeah. it's things like when I photograph someone and, and let's say you're walking into a, a VC firm, and this is part of the homework that you got to do ahead of time, you know, to know what that person is going to be, how you're going to be presented and who you're going to be received, who, yeah. who's looking at you. Um, you know, a lot of times yeah. I'll photograph someone and they'll have a pen in their hand and I'll be like, you can't use that pen. And they'll be like, why? And I was like, well, who's going to be looking at this image? You know, you've got some $400 pen in your hand. Now all of a sudden you're completely obnoxiously untouchable to the person who's going to be looking at this. Yeah. And yeah. at the same time, you walk yeah. in with some cheesy paper mate, you know, with the bent clip that you've been chewing on. Now all of a sudden it tells this yeah. other weird right. message. And so I think down to right. the, the nuance of, again, this comes back to, I got to get this in one yeah. frame. So I got to make sure that that pen is the right pen. Um, you know, it, it's, yeah. and, and the stance and everything. Um, yeah. It's so interesting. It's, I, you know, I, it's, I think it's one of the reasons that I feel so connected to you is because 
you're verbalizing a lot of things that I think I do without being conscious of it so much. I've gotten more conscious over the years and probably you have too. Uh, you know, I love that story about switching your boots, you know, and, and the difference that makes. And it reminds me of a time when my wife and I got in, I got invited to speak and train the speakers in Yemen. And, you know, like I was like, okay, I, you know, this is, this is dangerous, but I'm going to go do it, you know? And Sharon wanted to go. She was like, look, when am I going to get a chance to go to Yemen again? Of course I want to go. We didn't have our son yet. So it was just the two of us. So we didn't, you know, we could take the risk, but it felt like a big risk. And then on the way there, everybody told us, you know, don't go there, right? The people on the plane, as we were flying there, were like, you shouldn't go there. But we went there. They took great care of us. It was, it was a wonderful experience. We had an armed guard the whole time. It was kind of weird, but the 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 thing it reminds me of is that they gave me this Yemeni outfit, you know, as a present, as a welcome present, as a thank you present. And I said to the host, I said, do you think that people would, would it be, would it be good or would it be bad if I wore this when I spoke? And he said, oh my gosh, you would be willing to wear that? And I said, yeah, of course, I'd love to wear this. And he said, oh, people would love it, right? So... I wore my Western attire and everybody there was in Western attire. And I, but when I, right before I spoke, I ran upstairs, had somebody help put, put it on and they made sure I tied the scarf right and everything. And I came down and I gave my speech in that thing and people went bonkers. And then afterwards, you know, hours later, I was standing there alone by the elevator, getting ready to go up to my room. And this young guy came kind of running up to me and he was like, Mr. Bates, Mr. Bates. And I'm like, yes. And he says, you know, thank you for wearing that because I have resisted wearing that for my whole life because I've been embarrassed and I didn't want to wear it. And I, but it looks so good on you that I'm going to wear that from now on, you know, I'm going to try wearing that more often. And in a way it felt like what I went there for, you right. know what I mean? Right. It, and it was, it, and it was so simple for me, right? Like changing your boots, <laughs> you know, it was so simple, but it, 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 it was such a message, you know, and, and that's always really struck me how those little tiny things can just, they're the big things, really. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. And that's the little tiny thing that will, will piss you off about the meeting later or yeah. make them not say the yes at the end, you know, and it can be something weird. I mean, right. <clears throat> think back to why you broke up with someone when you were in ninth grade and you're like, well, I didn't really like the way their yeah. breath smell. <laughs> some stupid yeah. random some, thing. Some thing. Yeah. And it either connects you or it, or it, or it pushes you apart, right? Right, right. Which isn't to say that you should be so paranoid that you're trying to literally paint this artificial picture. Because I do think at the same time, you've got to just be oh, yeah, no, you. No, 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 yeah. Yes, it's, it has to be authentic, right? Yeah. So, and you've got, you know, I love your approach to creativity. We talked about it a little bit. And, and I also love the fact that you believe like I believe too, that everybody's got creativity inside of them. And so let's talk a little bit about your approach to creativity because you, you know, you do sculpture, you do photography. I mean, I just, you know, I think you're living art, you're breathing art, you are an artist. And, um, I think a lot of people in the business world think they're not, you know, Oh, I'm not artistic. I'm not creative, but I disagree, you know? So talk to us a little bit about creativity and your thoughts about creativity and your approach. So, I mean, I was not an artist going back years. Um, you know, I, I was a science major no. in college. I entered college as a physics major. Um, I fully expected science to be my future. Um, and when I kind of made the switch into photography after my senior year, I kind of, I, I talked about how it, 
I took a photo one class my senior year in college and it reinvigorated um, the artistic side of me that had gone dormant after um, third grade art class. And I think that was probably because I learned science yeah. and I was like captivated by it. Um, uh -huh. And I got to the point that I realized yeah. okay, this isn't really how I want to spend, you know, my career. Um, and all of a sudden I saw this like, oh, wait, art. Yeah, I was doing that, you know, when I was a kid. Um, this is sort of cool. And so yeah. I entered into the realm of photography. And even when I met you for the first time, I was still approaching it as a business. It was something that I was trying to get more clients and I was trying to, um, you know, move it forward, master the technology, technology side of things and, and get that part of it, you know, under my belt. Um, but it wasn't yep. until maybe the early knots. So now we're talking 15 years into my career that I was talking to a, uh, a creative consultant who was helping me work on my portfolio. Um, and she said, what are you doing for a personal project? Um, and I said, you know, I've, I've never really been able to do personal projects. And she says, that's a common thing with photography, with photographers, um, and probably any, any type of, uh, of commercial art, um, because you have so many different possibilities. It's really hard to narrow down on one. And I said, exactly. Like, I, I don't know what I should like focus on because my interest wane, waxes and wanes too quickly. Um, so, she said, well, I'll tell you what you've got to do. Um, she said, what is it that you like to photograph for no commercial purpose whatsoever? And I said, you know, I, I tend to shoot flowers. And she said, then I want you to go and photograph flowers for an hour a week. Um, don't think about selling the images later. Don't think about how you're doing them. Just go and shoot flowers for, for the sake of it. And so I found myself out in my rose garden, walking around them, shooting the thorns from the underside because I'm a flipping obnoxious New Englander and I'm like, what's the weird way to shoot flowers? <laughs> um, and in so doing, uh -huh. the theory was that whatever is percolating down below your subconscious, it's going to come to the surface when you're just in the art of making or the process of just making, just doing. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of, you yeah. know, it's sort of a Zen thing in a way, which you could look at it that way. You know, I'm just going to go and, and rake a path. Yeah. Um, and then your thoughts are going to kind of come forward. And I still do that in my regular process now. I mean, if I'm anxious about yeah. a shoot, I might go out and weed um, uh, a garden bed, you know, yeah. or just kind of do something yeah. sort of from a Zen approach. Anyway, so so fast forward, I, yeah. I ended up realizing that what I really wanted to photograph was fathers who were playing uh, an, an uncharacteristically societal role in their kids' lives. Um, I had young kids at the time, um, and so I ended up doing a book on fatherhood, which, you know, I ended up sending it to Gloria Steinem, and she wrote the introduction for it, which was kind of fun. Um, but that kind of got me on a right, path. Is that for of, sale anywhere? Uh, well, the, the 15 copies of it have, um, have done really well. <laughs> I've never really printed it that much. <laughs> I made a handful. Um, no. so yeah, it's, uh, it, it was a fun it, thing. So it's a self-published. It was self-published. Yeah. It was a blurb book at the time. Um, this was okay, in, well, uh, maybe uh -huh. 2006 ish, 2010 uh -huh. era. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah. but that got me started on a process which I have carried forward. Um, and I called it, I called shooting flowers my reset button. You know, whenever I got just yeah. stuck, um, I would go out and just yeah. do this same process. Um, and sometimes it would be taking a camera on vacation and just walking through the woods and photographing um, icicles or pine cones and just, just, right. it was a pensive kind of opportunity for me to think. So over the years, I have yeah. developed that into more of a need to do something creative every day. Now, don't, I don't want to imply that what I do for a living isn't creative. It is. But, my, and we talked about this also, much of my work lives in the ether. You know, I, I photograph these days. I don't, um, yeah. I retouch on a computer. I send the files to an ad agency in Germany and then they get printed in China. Yeah. And I don't touch stuff at the end of the day, like I yeah. used to. We used to be able to touch yeah. our film. And yeah. so <clears throat> I, I realized that I had a craving to be touching my work. Um, 
And yeah. having a, a 40 year background in playing with wood for uh, various things, making uh, my family's deck when I was 13 to chopping wood in, in my childhood to um, helping my dad build yeah. a giant shed in our backyard. Um, and then furniture and, um, and remodeling of our places. I, I started making sculpture. Um, and it was satisfying yeah. to me because it was a medium that I knew. Um, it was doing it in a different way than I had ever done before. Um, and when it comes to my woodworking skills, you know, I'm really good rough framer. I'm not a cabinet maker. Um, I think uh -huh. it's my impatience, uh -huh. but, but the sculpture gave me an opportunity yeah. to kind of be rough around the edges away. Um, and it allowed me to touch something. Um, and so I found it really fascinating and, and it kind of got to the point where I, I felt the need to do something every day. I felt the need to kind of, you yeah. know, play with wood in some way. And, um, and it really kind of fulfilled um, a hole, I think, uh, that was there in the digitization of photography. Um, and yeah. it kind of rounded me out a little bit. And now I also, I do sketching. I took a, a drawing class at a local university to learn how to um, just do figure drawing. Um, and because I didn't, again, I don't have an art background. I never went to the drawing classes that yeah. people with art degrees have. And yeah. I wanted to see not if I could be a better uh, drawer, because I knew that that wasn't going to happen. Um, but I wanted to see if it, if it caused <laughs> me to see things differently. Um, and, and it has in a way. And sometimes before I'm photographing, if, if it's a fitness thing, I might actually ask the person if I can sketch them for five minutes. Um, and it just allows me to see yeah. like quadriceps and biceps and just think about it a little bit. So that then when I'm lighting it, um, yeah. it, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a very ethereal connection, but I do feel like it, um, it has improved the way I see things and, and the way I can then make art. But going back to what you said um, yeah, no, in the introduction about how um, I think everybody has the ability to be creative. Um, and I don't think it needs to be art that is your creative outlet in a way. Um, you know, I'm in the process right now of building a 20,000 gallon rainwater collection thing that involves multiple drainage and lots of retaining walls and we're doing it all ourselves wow. um but envisioning uh -huh. it and trying to make it come to fruition i feel like is a little bit of an artistic thing because it's forcing you to envision yeah. something that's not there um and to go out yeah. of my comfort zone i mean constructing drainage is out of my comfort zone but i want to do it myself um because i think that that kind of helps you grow. It helps you, you know, when you go and speak or anything, whenever you can do something that scares you, I feel like you're benefiting from. Yeah. If you're like, oh shit, I got to go and do this and I'm really not comfortable, then that's going to be a good thing for you at the end of the day. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, and art and, and kind of fulfills that role for me. Construction fills that role. And I think yeah. anybody takes on a project, be it cooking or painting or playing with clay or landscape design or, or gardening. Um, and if you do it regularly, you start to reap the benefits in other areas because ideas come forward um, through that meditative process. Yeah. Um, and I do think that a different part of your brain exercises. And that's how I look at it. I see yeah. playing with sculpture. I see drawing. I see um, doing this stuff in my yard as exercise. It's it's creative exercise. And that exercise yeah. um, reaps benefits in areas that you're not expecting. That's where ideas come from. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you're uh, so I've I just committed, re recommitted myself to my meditation practice and 
I, uh, I love to play the guitar. I used to sing in a band, but I didn't play the guitar, uh, if much for the band. I was mostly the lead singer, you know, just jumping around, but I've always wanted to be better and understand music theory better and, and have a little more facility with the guitar. So I just started doing this, going through this book called guitar aerobics. And like every day there's a new little riff that you just, you know, play. And, um, and you know, what you're saying and what you've been saying about your flower photography and about, you know, your, your commitment to doing something every day, it, it, you know, it re-inspires me to stay with that commitment. Cause I, I think that I really got stuck. Like maybe a lot of people in, like, I love my business and it is for me a real creative outlet. And I, and I am super committed to my clients and I have these fabulous clients that I love. And I have a family. I've got a seven-year-old son. I've got my wife and I've feel like I've really forgotten about myself yeah. in that equation. And so that meditation time and that guitar aerobics time is something that I do for me as a commitment to me to show myself right. that I matter too, you know, and I do think it unlocks a different part of my brain and actually makes me more productive and effective in the time when I'm working specifically because it's not about work. Like I'm not, you know, I am not going to probably ever make much money playing a guitar, but I love to play the guitar and it's a creative outlet for me. And it frees me up for that time that I spend. No, I think that's it. great. And, but I would challenge you to rather than reading the thing each day, do more of a, what if, what if, I don't even know uh -huh. if this is a chord. Does this sound good? Because I think that yeah. the exercise right now, you said, I've tried to commit myself right. to doing this. And a lot of people look at exercise or running. I'm going to try to commit myself to do it. Yep. Eventually, that commitment to right. doing it changes. Yep. And yep. I think it changes to a need. And I think people who are, you know, getting into fitness, they yeah. eventually realize I need to work out, you know, otherwise I'm just not comfortable. And I think the same thing happens in a creative yep. outlet. It's going to eventually yeah. turn from, oh, this is something I'm trying to get myself to do, to this is something I need to do. This is like part of sanity. This is part of health. Um, and it doesn't, yeah. like I said, I, I, I don't like to think of it yeah. as it definitively has to be this. You know, it could be anything that day. And that is, yeah. opens art up to a yeah. big, huge breadth of, um, of of what it can be. I mean, your Zen moment could be planting trees. I've gotten very into planting trees these days and just caring for it and yeah. um, and noticing the yeah. leaf color. I mean, this gets back to me being a freakishly noticing. Stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, I have an obscene amount of trees on my property. And, noticing and, and observing. it's yeah, frustrating when I talk to my wife. I'm like, you know, that apple that's turning green. And she's like, which that's apple great. tree? I'm like, the one that was green and now it has a slight bit of yellowing and that third leaf from the upper right. You know, I just, uh, I just yeah. don't notice that, but, yeah. but that becomes a Zen uh -huh. thing. You know, it's a, it's, it's to me, planting and maintaining my property yeah. is a bit of a, uh, of my religion, you know, um, the religion of, of water and, oh, and man, trees it sounds and nature. Wonderful. Um, and, and, you know, like you say, um, you're not going to make a ton yeah. of money um, with your guitar. I don't intend to make a bunch of money with my um, my sculpture. Um, my goal with my sculpture is to make sure it keeps moving out of the studio so that I cannot have too much stuff in the studio. And so I have a big sale uh, once a year. I have a big open studio because <laughs> uh, I make big things and I'm, I'm making bigger and bigger things. But it's not like I'm desperately seeking yeah. representation for my sculpture. Yeah. Um, I just want to keep doing it because it's fun. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, listen, I promised I'd get you out of here in about three minutes from now. So, uh, and I think that's a great 
that's that's a great note to leave it on is is having fun because I do think that at the end of the day that just becomes more and more important you know I just I just had my birthday and I'm getting older and I have just realized that yeah if it's not fun I don't want to do it I, I don't have time for it right. if it's not fun, you know, <laughs> like, and, um, so is there anything that you'd like to say to just close us out beyond, you know, ending with, with having fun? Cause I'm, I'm so honored and stoked that you joined me today. And I think this is a great conversation. Is there anything you'd like to leave us with before we go? I, I think, it, you know, it, if you're going to choose a pursuit to challenge yourself, and and play with and don't be married to it if it's not fun six weeks later go and move do, do something else you know go and take a clay class or um uh, or just start yeah. painting but don't look at it as something like oh are these going to be amazing you know um you're doing it for you you don't have to feel like your your grandmother being forced to go and um, look at her watercolors that she's showing all her friends in their really crappy watercolors. Don't worry about showing it to anybody. Just, um, is, again, you're doing it for you. And if you throw it away at the end of the day, cool. You know, um, that it's just the, it's the exercise that's more important. And I really like to, yeah. Um, yeah. to, to push that word exercise because that kind of changes, it changes the pressure in a lot of ways because it's like okay am i creative i don't know i'm not artistic well you're not trying to be artistic you're just trying to exercise a part of you that's all and have fun doing it yeah yeah i think that's a great a great challenge and i accept <laughs> so <laughs> Good bob day. thank you very very much i enjoyed thanks it for, thanks for joining us and yeah, so did I. So did I. And I think everyone hearing it is going to enjoy it as well. And uh, again, you can find Bob at Robert Hauser, R-O-B-E-R-T-H-O-U-S-E-R.com. And I encourage you to go look because just some gorgeous, gorgeous photographs and great sculptures that you'll find. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, Bob. More than welcome. Appreciate it. And to those of you listening, thank you for joining us. And I will see you next time on speaklikealeader.show. Thank you for joining the Speak Like a Leader podcast. Go be awesome.